I'm excited for this class. And I just noticed when I went pee before we started, this is some subconscious shit, but I'm wearing a Grateful Dead shirt today. And we're talking about death on Zoom. So welcome to death on Zoom with me. If you haven't met me before, my name is Alicia Turner. Alicia Turner. Sometimes I say my name weird. Alicia Turner. I'm a life coach, a holistic confidence coach to be exact. That is what I dubbed myself once I certified. And I help women fall madly and deeply in love with themselves. The reason this is my specialty is because I used to hate myself. Hey, uh, like loathe entirely. And once I learned how to love myself, my whole world changed and my life opened up before me. And it was like I got a brand new lease on life. Everything became easier, simpler, more exciting and rewarding and fulfilling through this lens of love that I didn't know existed or was available to me prior in all the hate. I thought the hate was just normal and regular and there was no such thing as love, right? Turns out I was wrong, thank God. So I think it's kind of an epidemic in our world right now that most women aren't loving themselves because women are so powerful and could literally have healing powers and healing solutions for this entire world. But because women have been socialized to hate themselves, it's not an accident that that's how I was, right? It's not an accident. That's how most women are. We're socialized to see ourselves as objects, right? Sex objects. <laughs> um, and we're also socialized to believe we're inherently unworthy. We're inherently not enough. Inherently, something is wrong with us, right? But really, all that's wrong is we were born into a patriarchy. So this conditioning keeps us stuck in spirals of shame and anxiety, right? It has women believing that they don't deserve amazing, incredible, powerful things that are all available to them right now. It's my power shirt, okay? So anyway, we're not going to talk about that today. We're talking about death on Zoom. But I will talk about that a little more at the end if you want to know what it's like to work with me. That is what I help people with. Um, I just want to note I have a podcast called Stop Punishing Yourself, which is basically about how women are taught to punish themselves by living in a patriarchy and how we can unlearn all of that shit. And it's very fun. So go listen to that. And anyway, let's begin. My goal here today with this class is to help you feel more confident, relaxed, and peaceful around the very crunchy, sharp subject of death. Okay, we're going to smooth that shit out. So here are my deliverables for this call, for our time together today. You will leave this call with a shiny new replacement mindset for death. We're going to take the one you have, we're going to take it out of the oven and put a way cooler one in the oven and close that door, okay? It will be in extreme contrast to the one you have now, the one you were given. I'm going to go through all of that and explain it soon, okay? You will also leave this call with a very easy, simple exercise to use as a backup in case of emergencies right? Just in case the replacement one I give you today isn't cutting it, which happens, right? It happens to me. It's okay. So those are my deliverables. Let's dive in. Before we get into the nitty gritty work of defining and explaining these two mindsets, I want to tell you why on earth I decided to do this class on death, right? And what gives me the authority to come talk to you about death, right? I give me the authority, bitch, okay? Just kidding. Here's the deal. I think about death a lot, like a lot. And I do not mean like I listen to murder podcasts or watch really violent shows. I actually hate all of that. I do not consume any of it. I'm not interested in stuff like that, that genre. That is not what I'm saying. Um. I can hardly handle like mild violence in TV and movies now. I'm like, I turn it off. I'm like, if it's not The Office, I'm not watching it. So when I say I think about death a lot, I mean like my death, 
right? Me dying, that's what I mean. Or my loved ones dying. Or just the general act of dying, like the moment a heart stops. And it's not even just for humans. I think about all death on planet Earth and in galaxies beyond, right? There's a death of a star. Do you know what that is? I'm obsessed with like astrophysics, quantum physics. I took so much astronomy in college. Why? I don't know. I just liked it. Okay. I think about the death of a tree, a plant, a flower. I think about the death of a deer, right? Getting eaten by a crocodile or a lion. I think about a spider killing flies in her web. Think about the mosquito's death that I just smushed. And I've actually started recently deciding like, I don't want to kill any and all bugs, only mosquitoes. That is my rule. But I like stopped wanting to kill spiders. Even if they're in my house, I'm like, I respect you, Mr. Spider. I do not want you to die. Just please leave the vicinity. Please exit the premises. And I do not want to kill you. Because I just am like, who the fuck am I to kill the spider? This spider, Charlotte, has a whole family and friends. And they're going to be pissed if Alicia kills Charlotte. So unless it's a mosquito, I'm not killing it. Okay. I think about death to this extent and this often. And I think that is the stamp of a true philosopher because we essentially begin at the end. Classic Harry Potter quote, author is a classic philosopher, right? And it's from this place of beginning at the end and how we approach our lives or just our days or just our decision, we begin at the end. That is where all of our amazing questions, our valuable insights, and all of our deep wisdom comes from. And if you don't know, now you know. Life coaches are philosophers. Philosophers are life coaches. Okay. So if you're a client of mine, please begin referring to me as your personal philosopher. Okay. Thank you. So I would say my thoughts about death started in 2001. That was a crazy year for death for little Alicia. Okay. It was like back to back to back shit. And so it started the year off with my my second dog. Uh, the first one died when I was younger, but she was my most beloved dog. She regulated all of my emotions. She was my emotional support animal. And she suddenly died. She was really young. She was only three. And it was awful. It was like the hardest blow I think I've ever had in my childhood life, which I might sound bad with what I'm about to say, but it was really, really hard for me. And then just shortly after that, 9-11 happened, which was a worldwide tragedy, right? But then not three months later, my mom's dad, my grandpa, he had lived in Detroit, Michigan. That's where my mom was raised. He was murdered in his own home. Sorry, just like warning. Uh, it was just two people that wanted to rob his house ended up killing him, right? So since 2001, it's really been on my noggin. That was like a big year where it was just like, here you go, Alicia. Think about death, would you? And I'm just like, okay, 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 okay. I'll think about it. But I will say it wasn't until 11 years later, 2012, one of my best friends died, who I also happened to be madly in love with, which I think kind of helped with this uh mindset I'm about to give you today. So my fascination, my curiosity of death truly began then when I was 21 years old. And I full stopped, like full stopped looking at death as a bad negative thing. I started to see the kind of peaceful, loving kindness of what is just beyond death and before death, right? Right on the other side of it, I kind of started sensing this more loving aura around death, okay? And it really contrasted with how everyone else was handling it. And so this is where I, I've gotten, I've collected the information for what I'm going to give you today is really around what I learned from that in 2012. So there's going to be a lot of nuance today. Let me get you ready for it. Because what you're not going to do is hear me saying, be happy and excited about death all the time or be super glad when someone you love dies because that is not what I'm saying ever. When someone we love dies, 
I'm saying there can be both. There can be peace about it and grief, right? There can be deep sadness and great love and acceptance of it. There can be sharp pain of missing them and the eternal joy of knowing that their soul is still connected to yours, right? So this is my message here, okay? Do not hear what I'm saying and go tell your friends, Alicia said to be really happy about death all the time. No, nuance. So if you want to hang out with philosophers more, you have to hold more than the binary ways we have been taught to think, right? We have to start living in that gray area and exit stage right from the black and white thinking, the all or nothing, the either or. Throw it away. Chuck it. Okay, so in 2012, I was able to cultivate so much acceptance and peace around his very sudden, unexpected death which didn't make much sense for me at the time because mentally, emotionally, I was very unhealthy. I was very depressed and anxious. I still hated myself at that time. I didn't have anyone guiding me, right? Except for, unless you consider him guiding me, which I do. Um, And somehow I was able to successfully reject this mainstream mindset about death that says you have to be miserable about someone's death. There are no positive, no upsides. You have to resist the death having happened. You have to think it shouldn't happen. It's like an unspoken rule around death in our society. You you have to punish yourself, right? That's like a requirement in our shaming culture. Punish yourself because you weren't fully prepared and ready for that death. You weren't expecting them to die. So now you should live a lifetime of guilt, regret, sorrow, and immense prolonged suffering because this is what we're steeped in, right? Everyone just suffer and and enjoy it, right? I decided not to play by those rules at all. So I'm gonna explain this in detail, but a short little story first because I thought this was amazing, more synchronicities like my shirt. So Steven used my phone for a voice recording the other day and I randomly scrolled through them. I was like, you know, I haven't looked at these in a bit. And I definitely use my voice recordings all the time. I'm straight up like Michael Scott when he's like t-shirt idea. Like I do that all the time. If I have an idea, I'm just like Boop, voice recording. So I'd already decided I'm doing this class on death and I scroll down and I found a voice recording titled death recorded July 5th, 2021. So just a couple years ago. And I, here's what is said. I'm going to try it. I think I like wrote it almost exactly as I said it. I would just play it, but it's a little too fuzzy. So here's what I said. I said, my brain keeps reminding me daily of the reality of death. Tonight, when it popped in my head as I left work, I felt a warm, fuzzy feeling. I felt overwhelming love as I drove home for the road I'm driving on, scenery around me the lagoon I had just passed, and the birds in the sky. So I worked at a restaurant, and so I drive home on a summer night in Alaska. That means the sun is still out, especially in July. And I'm just imagining it was a very pretty night that ignited these thoughts. So little detour there. I knew it would all exist after me, just as it all existed before me, kind of speaking to the lagoon, the birds, the roads, right? Life, civilization, it'll exist before and after me. It made me feel really present and overwhelmed with love. The closer we keep death in our minds, the more alive we feel, the more life we experience, and the more we have to appreciate in the now. The farther we keep death in our minds, the more we pretend death isn't going to happen for us. The more we avoid facing the inevitability of it, the less life we experience. The more likely we are to become unappreciative, complacent, stagnant. The less likely we are to take bold risks, chase our dreams, and create a life filled with passion and unconditional love. I had, I loved myself at this point. So I had come full circle from hating to loving myself. And you can just tell from the magic that's flowing through me. I think the biggest disservice society has ever done to death's reputation 
is to instill it in our minds as something negative, scary, and bad. Death can be beautiful. Death can inspire us to live. The more we pretend like death isn't coming or shouldn't be coming, the less likely likely we are to ever wake up to the fact that we are fully alive right now. The more likely we'll hide and stray away from our big dreams and our big love. Plane farting in the sky. Pause. Death should be coming because it is. And I like to remain fully aware of that truth. Remember, we're all going to die. So don't take everything so seriously. End quote. Mic drop. I loved it. I was like, damn, this is so helpful. I'm going to read that on my class. So here we go. We're going to go over the mindset you were given about death. The replacement one I'm offering you today. I'm not telling you you have to use it. You could. It's a take it or leave it situation. And then I'm going to give you an easy exercise for heightened anxiety, heightened fear, just in case of emergencies. Okay. This is how we're taught to think about death. Let's review. Death is bad and scary always. <clears throat> Hold on, I need water. <clears throat> Keep death far, far away from me at all costs. Don't think about death. Don't talk about death. I should be afraid of death right? I need to use everything in my human power to prevent it. That is like priority one is to prevent death. Not your fulfillment, not your well-being, not your happiness, not the well-being of your relationships. Your number one priority is to prevent death. Think about this, you guys. Slow it down and think about it. Sunny really wants to come in. And before this, I said, Sunny, come in. And she was like, no. So, I'm on in, girl. Want to talk about death? Okay. No one and nothing should ever die. We're thinking this, but we're not aware of it. Make sure to try and hyper vigilantly control everything and everyone around you so death doesn't somehow come sooner than it's supposed to right? We think there's like mistakes that can be made when people die. And so we need to spend all of our energy controlling everything so it doesn't come sooner than it's supposed to. Think about how much of a disservice that does to your mental and emotional well-being to just think that there's a time you're supposed to die and I need to make sure it doesn't come sooner. Oh, no, thank you. There's a time and a way death is supposed to happen again, and here, here it is. It's always supposed to be at age 100, in perfect health, passing peacefully in your sleep, surrounded by love and magical fairies. That's what we think. We're think and if someone doesn't die that way at that time in that health, something's gone terribly wrong, right? Anytime our brain is thinking something's gone wrong, we are off track. We are headed in the wrong direction. We should feel a constant steady stream of fear and anxiety around the t subject of death, because if we do, if we feel all the fear and anxiety, it will ward it off, right? It's like you're using your anxiety like to protect yourself and it's not protecting you. It's draining you and death is still coming. Here to deliver the happy news. We shouldn't ever talk about the reality of death unless a death event happens right? It's kind of that unspoken law. Like we only talk about death when it suddenly and tragically happens. And before and beyond that, we continue to shove it under the rug, ignore its existence and don't talk about it, right? Don't acknowledge it. Don't plan for it, right? Outside of a will, which even that there's like all this awkwardness around. It's like, no, let's talk about it at breakfast. Hello. Good morning. Would you like to talk about dying? That's me. All we should say around the topic of death is that it's tragic, bad, shouldn't happen, right? Think about how limited black and white that is. It's bad, 
right? It's so not fun for a philosopher when that's the way we're thinking about things. I'm like, that is so boring and it doesn't serve us, okay? Death should always freak us out, be seen as the worst case possible, worst possible scenario. I worded that weird. Children shouldn't die. Oof. And especially not before their parents. This is a very painful thought, especially when children die all the time. We'll talk about it more. Illness and disease shouldn't kill people. Basically, people should all be in perfect health at all times. Unrealistic much? Accidents shouldn't happen. Death should be within my control. I should have control over it. Right? It should happen on my time. So for time's sake, I capped the mindset there. But I would challenge you on your own to find some of your thoughts about death. What have you been thinking about death? When, when someone you love has died in the past or when you think about it in the future and you, maybe some feelings of fear come up, I want you to write down what your thoughts are about death to see if there's anything I'm missing because there's got to be. There's so much more to the collective mindset around death, to the societal ways we're taught to think about death. So do this exercise. Find out what's there for you, okay? So I like to sum up this mindset we're given, that we're taking out of the oven, as the prevent defense and control mindset because I just froze. That's so funny. <laughs> I got tripped up on a sentence and brain shut off. Okay. This is the prevent, defense, and control mindset because every thought in this mindset is some flavor of you're only thinking it because you think that thought will help you prevent death or it will help defend you against the either the just the awareness of death or from death itself. Or the thought is trying to, it's being used to control uncontrollable circumstances. So if you're a client of mine, we talk about separating out circumstances and just kind of surrendering to like, we don't have control over them. But in this mindset, we're subtly trying with all of our energy to control things we can't. Death is one of those things. It goes in the circumstance line. We don't control it, right? But we're using that control. We're, we're doing it for a reason, right? We're not absolutely crazy. We think the trade-off will be if I can control everything, everyone, what everyone does, it'll eliminate the possibility of death and we'll be marked safe from the Grim Reaper. And it's just not the case. If we really stopped, set down the bike and looked at where we were, we'd see all that control we're using does not eliminate the possibility. The possibility, it's not a possibility, right? It's inevitability. But the possibility of the when and the how, we have no idea, okay? And so we won't be marked safe when we try to prevent defense and control it. We won't. I just gotta tell you the truth today. So all of the sentences in, these, in this mindset are thoughts. If you don't already work with me, then you might not know this, but Thoughts are all optional. They are not factual. They aren't based in reality. That A thought is something entirely different than what's actually happening in reality. And your brain does not perceive reality accurately. Like hardly ever. That's why we got to do so much tedious work to like present reality in a more accurate way to your brain to help you feel better. Because your brain interprets reality in a distorted way. And it does this by way of thought thought by what you're choosing to think about. And so thoughts are a decision. They are a choice and you can re-decide, re-choose at any point in time. That's the power of mindset awareness. It's the power of coming and getting your life coaching and your philosopher work because we're getting you back in that power of that choice. That is your ultimate power. And so you know a thought is a thought when you can make an argument for it and against it. You cannot make an argument against a fact. And so that's why I teach people when you say something like they're mean, it's not a fact, right? They're not mean. You're thinking they're mean and there could be an argument against them not being mean. A fact is they said these words. A fact is 
that this human exists, right? It's so much different than the story we're choosing to tell about it. So our collective thoughts about death are what are creating our collective feelings about death because thoughts cause feelings. Collective thoughts cause collective feelings. These thoughts in this mindset, they are creating the dominant emotions of stress, fear, anxiety, overwhelm, horrified, powerless, despair, frustrated, betrayed, resentful, let down, threatened, out of control, nervous, remorseful, guilty. I could go on, but I'm going to stop there. Our feelings are what drive our actions. So when those feelings, those are our dominant emotions and they're driving our actions, what we do from them is we hide from living. We literally hide and stay small. We avoid anything that could be potential death, which is everything, right? We'll do the bare minimum. It's funny, we'll get in a car every day, but we won't take a risk on like, going after what we want or saying what we want to say, but we'll strap ourselves into a death machine or a death plane, right? And be like, this is cool. Otherwise, we're avoiding so much else, right? We're avoiding speaking our mind. We're avoiding taking risks. We're avoiding taking a stand and disappointing someone because of these dominant feelings driving our behavior. We pretend, y'all. We pretend everything's okay. I'm not having a panic attack. I'm happy. I don't hate myself, right? I think I'm all right. This is pretending that is driven from these dominant emotions. So we pretend like death isn't coming. We pretend like we're happy when we're not. We pretend, pretend, pretend. We don't take worthy chances. We don't say what we want to say. We don't do what we want to do. We don't go after our most audacious dreams that would blow our minds. We just slowly absorb ourselves into that collective and we hide like everyone else we keep the same story about death the same customs the same culture the same mindset and we stay afraid right everyone around us is afraid we continue to assume death is this bad thing and we never think about it because we're driven by this unquestioned fear of it Like, should we really be afraid of death? What a good question, Alicia. I'd love to answer it. It's so imperative that we start to question our thoughts about death because otherwise these dominant emotions and actions stemming from them are creating the result for us, which is our choice of an empty and unfulfilling life. It's not exciting. It's not full. You're not awake and present to it, right? One day, right, if we keep this up, if we could fast forward it and keep the same dominant thoughts, feelings, and actions, you would, I promise you, get to the end of your life. Look back on how you spent your time stressed and afraid and tweaking out and trying to control everything because you're afraid of dying, because you're afraid of the inevitable. You're going to wish you could have gone back and just relaxed a little bit more, right? Like Alicia's quote earlier, don't take things so seriously, you're gonna die, right? I live by that now. I used to take everything so seriously. So I'm right there with you. This isn't about judgment. This isn't about shaming. This is about awareness that frees us, okay? We're gonna want to relax and not later, now. Take things just a little less seriously, Right. If we fast forward and saw we spent the rest of our time being stressed and afraid, we would look back and be like, damn, I had other options there. I wish I didn't spend my time like that. And the thing with time is you can only spend it once. It's a one time deal. It's the only non renewable resource humans have. You can't create more time. Let that sink in. I think so many people are confused about this. They think time is like renewable and infinite. It's not. It's finite, non-renewable. You can't create more. That is how precious and how urgent it is for you to be aware of death. You want to spend your time wisely. I promise you. I am like an old soul who's probably lived thousands of lifetimes. I would have been burned as a witch, 100%. So just take it from this weirdly aware little girl. 
Okay. I'm not a little girl. I resent that. I love to think about death because of this, because I think about the end and I'm like, oh, I want to use my time. I don't care if that seems scary. I don't care if I feel nauseous when I make that decision. I'm going, I'm going all in. There's no time to waste. When my friend died, I literally, that's all I could think about. No time to waste, no time to waste, right? So let's ask, is death really scary and bad? Here's my opinion. No, it's quite the contrary. All right, let's talk about the replacement mindset I have for you because I think I've covered enough about that. I've made my point. Please tell me if you have any questions, reach out. Okay, so I want you to think of what we're doing now. What I'm about to do is you've got this janky 1998 Toyota Corolla, okay? It's maroon, it's rusty. Her name's Linda, right? And we're gonna, I'm gonna be like, oh girl, let me replace your car for you. I'm gonna replace it permanently with this brand new 2024 BMW. I don't know like, the, like I know Corolla, but I don't know names of BMWs. So just think of one, okay? But it's it's nice. That is how I feel about the upgrade of mindset on death that I'm giving you today. It is luxurious. It's new and exciting and like fresh and expansive. It's incredible. Okay, so are you ready? Death? <laughs> I need water, you guys. I talk a lot. Death is loving, safe, and natural. I want you to think about that. Let your arms go and fall back into the plush flower bed of death. It's loving. It's safe. It's natural. Okay? I want to keep death close, close, close to me at all costs keep death close because again it's loving it's safe it's there for you I don't want to let death get too far away from me because if I do I lose the awareness of the present moment when you let death slip into the the background when you ignore it and avoid it because you're afraid of what you're thinking about it you lose the ability to cherish right where you are to wake up to it to appreciate it, to live in it, to experience it. I want to think about and talk about death regularly, not just with myself, with with my loved ones, right? Because when I do, my life feels richer. My relationships get deeper. Everything is more meaningful when I'm aware of death and paying attention. I shouldn't be afraid of death because there's nothing to be afraid of for mine or anyone else's I know or any deer out there I shouldn't be afraid of it I used to see like a bird like a roadkill or like in a movie like a dog died and I it's something with animals I care more about animals um and before I had this mindset it would feel like I couldn't I'd be like something went wrong they weren't supposed to die But now I very gently and lovingly come in and say, I shouldn't be afraid of death on any level, in any form, because death is a part of nature. Death is a normal, essential part of the cycles of life, right? We don't want to stuck something in the cycle and clog it, right? We don't want that. We think we do when we're not paying attention, when we're not aware, But no, there are cycles for a reason. Nature is wise and intelligent and infinitely more aware and smart than we are, than our little tiny ego brains are, right? So that's why I'm just like, oh, nature, you are so smart. You got this, right? I'm so glad I'm not in charge because I would fuck all of this up in like two days. So death is nothing to be afraid of because it's a part of nature and I can trust nature. Nature is abundant and loving and kind okay you can call that reality you can call that god you can call that the universe i use all of these words interchangeably right they're all the same thing essentially 
I play a small but significant part in the grand cycles of this universe and not just earth, y'all, the cycles of energy. I'm a physics nerd, right? I know those laws of thermodynamics. I study the science and I bring in the spirituality and I'm just like, click. And then it's like, and here Alicia is, okay? So it's really ancient cycles of energies. We are stardust, y'all. That is in our DNA. So I'm not pulling this shit out of thin air, okay? We are a spark of life itself. Just a flicker, right? Just temporary. And then we return to what's before and beyond, right? Which I do not mean heaven or hell. That's a different topic for a different motherfucking day. But that is not what I'm talking about. Okay. I think it's an honor to be a part of it. And I am not going to squander this opportunity, this privilege of being alive and experiencing life. And I keep death close to keep that energy momentum going. Because the minute I hide death in the corner, I start getting real entitled. I start feeling real unappreciative to why aren't things going my way? My experience isn't good enough, right? It's icky. It's an icky, icky place to be. We honor the cycles of nature that have brought us to be, right? You didn't create your ass. Not even your mom did, right? Your mom is the consciousness operating the body. She is not the body. The brilliance of nature is the body and the body created you. Okay, so you didn't create you. You shouldn't have any entitlement over your life or if you have children, their life. They belong to nature. This is the level of surrender we are going for. Are y'all with me? My time here is a gift. It's not a given, okay? Again, kind of bringing in that entitlement. When we feel entitled to our time, when we feel entitled to life bending to meet our will, we're totally disregarding our place, right? Our opportunity. We are not the rulers or the centers of the universe. We are tiny sparks on the edges, okay? And I like to remind myself of that, humble myself to that fact and use my time by reminding myself that at any moment, any fucking moment unknown to me, poof, it's over. And that doesn't have to be scary. To me, that's comforting, okay? So if you're not there yet, that's okay. You'll come back to this. Once you work through the initial thoughts and feelings you have. There's nothing I need to do to prevent my death. Think about that. What if you removed all the ways you operate that are subtly or overtly preventing your death? Right? It's so funny to watch people who are afraid of death do things that make death more likely. Like when you're really, really afraid of dying, you tend to like over drink or over consume stuff that's not good for your physical body because you're trying to avoid the feeling of that discomfort of fearing death. And then you make death more likely because you're causing disease and right, you're not nourishing this incredible spark of nature, right? And so it's very ironic. We're trying to prevent death or we're like, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. Right? I don't want anything bad to happen. And then we prevent opportunities of experiences that would make us feel alive, right? We don't want to die because we're like, I think I should live. And yet when we're thinking, I don't want to die, we don't live. When we think I want to die, or I'm going to die, right? Not I want to die. It's not what I meant. When we're thinking, I'm definitely going to die and I know it, we live. We go do the thing. We get a little uncomfortable and we're like, I'm scared. I feel nervous and I'm going to do it because I know I'm going to die. Right? Do you hear me? Hear that nuance and that reversal. Everything's upside down. I don't need to prevent anyone else's death. Right? I know a lot of parents out there. It's part of that story of children shouldn't die, but the reality of it is is some children do die. Not all children. We don't want it to happen. I'm not saying we got to love it. That is not what I'm saying. 
but they do. And so when you prevent their death, guess what you do? You get all creepy up in their business. You don't give them autonomy. You don't let them become their own authority. So they grow up to be adults who are insecure, equally afraid and paranoid and stressed out. It's not in service to their highest good. And so it sounds backwards to say, don't prevent their death. But in a more relaxed and peaceful state, guess what? You're more aware. You make better decisions. You literally create an atmosphere of saferness. Making up words. When you're stressed and panicked and freaking out, guess what? You become sloppy. You're not thinking clearly. It's more likely in a stressed state of mind for accidents to happen. So I will leave you with that. Because I know the words don't sound correct, but I promise them when you put them through the thinking machine, they make perfect sense. Trust your philosopher on this. I can take a deep breath and surrender, right? I can stop wasting my energy preventing. The purpose of life is not to prevent death. It's to live while I'm still alive. Okay? I'm not supposed to know when I'm going to die or when anyone else is going to die. Not. I have no idea. No idea. And so don't try to think of it. I can see you be like, okay, well, wait, it could be tomorrow. It could be next week. No, I'm not supposed to know. Literally not supposed to know. I'm only supposed to remember that I've got no idea when or where or why. And just stay awake to the beauty and the pain of being alive, right? There's both, not just beauty, not just peace, pain. Pain is okay too. Bring it in. Everything, including me, should die. Again, you got to put it through the thinking machine for it to make sense. But that's the reality of it. Everything, including me, does die. That's the reality of it, okay? I love to agree with reality because it's always right. I find that my limited ego, lazy brain is almost always not right, okay? It's almost always setting me up for failure, stressing me out, and taking me somewhere I don't want to go. So I just learned, oh, I agree with reality. Yep, that sounds good. She's smart. Right, she's way she she knows way more than I do. She knows how to create humans. I can barely do calculus. I struggled through calculus. Okay, that is why I don't know what should or shouldn't be, and I just trust reality because the universe created calculus, not me. Okay, everyone dies exactly when they are supposed to. This is one of my favorite thoughts. It freed me from a lot of, a lot of stress. I used to think, you know, something shouldn't have happened, but this extreme like reversal of how the world thinks everyone dies exactly when they're supposed to, it just takes that weight off that doesn't need to be there, right? So if we think people die not a minute too soon or a minute too late, but right on time, right when they're supposed to. And we just start to trust that nature makes no mistakes. What a relief. We can stop doing all that preventing and controlling. We can stop beating ourselves for the people we lost and, and believing that painful story that they shouldn't have. That doesn't serve them or you or your life now, right? So that's why I'm saying you get to try this on. This is a take it or leave it. But again, how much more helpful is it to think about it in alignment with reality? Okay. I won't spend any time pretending like my limited perspective can know when death should or shouldn't happen. I kind of already said that. Death is supposed to be different for everyone, right? It's not supposed to be that story. It's not supposed to be 100 years old, peacefully in your sleep for everyone. It's supposed to be different. It's supposed to look different. It's supposed to vary. It's not all supposed to be the same. What a relief, right? Again, how much energy are we funneling when we stop putting our attention on 
preventing and just open ourselves up to what else can I create? What can I do while I'm here? What fun can I have? So nice. We're not all supposed to die the same way. Again, I trust nature. I trust that I'm supposed to have. I mean, I trust that I'm not supposed to have that universal giant playbook of all living things, right? That's not for me to have. That's not my job. My job is my business. And guess what my business is? It only includes my thoughts, my feelings, my actions, and my results. I don't have to worry about anything else. I don't have to worry about the leaves growing on the trees. I don't have to worry about my husband's thoughts and feelings. I don't have to worry about what's going on in the corporate world or the structure and the economy of America. I don't have to worry about what's going on across the planet. I don't have to worry about the asteroids floating around in space. I only have to worry about what I think, feel, and do, and create for myself. What a relief. Not every human or living thing is supposed to be in perfect health, right? They're not all supposed to be able-bodied. They're not all supposed to live until they're 100. And that's okay, right? Again, what is reality? It's that. So that must mean it's right. We should feel peace and allowance around the subject of death, right? And this is in contrast to resistance and fear. We should feel peace and allowance because it's coming whether we spend all of our time pushing it away, pretending it's not, it's there or not. It is coming. Death is coming. Ring the bells. Death is coming. That's a good thing. Let's celebrate. Let it arrive with open hands and a life well lived for you in awareness, okay? We should talk about death more than just at funerals, right? More than just in the hospital. More than we do now. Far more. Death is for us, not against us. What a concept. Death is not the worst case scenario. I promise you it's not. Do not pity the dead. Pity the living and above all, those who live without love. The worst case scenario, this is how I live, is arriving at death having spent all of your time in prevent, defense, and control mode in anxiety, stress, and fear mode. That is the worst case scenario, to spend your living waking moments in that state of helplessness when you are an infinite, powerful spark of motherfucking God. That is the worst case scenario. Another mic drop. Children die sometimes, and I'm willing to face that reality without resistance. I do not need death to be within my control before I have permission to live a full life. I just need to keep death close to me, hold the nuance of the pain and the beauty of being fully alive. So I call this mindset, that's all I'm giving you today. I could talk another 50 hours on it, but you'll have to catch me another time. I call this mindset the aware the allowing, and the surrendered mindset. Because every thought brings you closer to awareness, to allowing reality to do its thing, trusting in the brilliance and the intelligence of it, and then surrendering to your experience. You have so much more power and influence from a surrendered state of being. When you are tight and crunchy and sharp and you're just so wonky, right? You're not in control of anything when you're trying to control everything. When you're surrendered, you are in control of yourself entirely, of of your experience entirely. That is powerful. So this is where a full life is lived, in my opinion. This is where we move through time and we use it in a way with more power with more intention, right? Literally, your thoughts become things and it is the coolest process. How many times have I thought my thoughts become things? Too many to count now. And it's so exciting. And the more I teach more people about it, I'm just like, this is so cool, right? Because all of this past decade, I'm moving closer and closer to life. And guess what's happening? My life is getting more and more amazing, bigger, juicy, exciting. Okay, so I just want to share that about death. 
Okay. We can have more influence, more impact, right? Think about like, I teach someone, I heal someone emotionally or they heal themselves rather, but I show them how to do it. I help them fall in love with themselves. They go out and that spreads to everyone around me. That's like, ooh, it's like the spreading, you know, if it was like lights lighting up, like I have impact in my community because of what I'm doing, because I'm not hiding, right? And uh, I gotta stay safe, I don't wanna die. It's like, no, I wanna die. And before I die, I wanna live a full life. We truly become more fearless, more courageous, and brave the more we think about death in this way. So this specific mindset, I mean. Don't think about death in the other way. You won't become more fearless. You will become more and more afraid, less and less brave. Okay, so that's what I mean by that. So these are all thoughts as well. Optional thoughts. You could find evidence for and against them. They are not factual reality, but they are optional. Read the book called Useful Delusions by Neuroscientists. Okay? Because logic, rationality, it is not the high and mighty for our human experience. Sometimes we need the useful delusion, even if they are delusion. So much of what we experience is a delusion. Use them in a useful way. That serves you. That serves your experience. That serves the reality of it all. So again, these thoughts open you up to a world of feelings that the other mindset has limited. So in the other mindset, you've got a range of like stress, fear, overwhelm. Not much wiggle room for anything else. There's like helpless in there, worry, right? It's not fun. I call that unnecessary suffering. This mindset opens up a full spectrum and we've got all of it. We've got the pain and the joy, the beauty. We've got the sadness you're allowed to feel, the juicy sadness that we feel as humans. We've got confidence, creativity, unconditional love which is actually one of the most bittersweet feelings right it's not happy right I don't even think I wrote happy because that's not the point we feel successful powerful thankful cheeky free awe amazed inspired sensitive proud accepted belonging valued intimate it's one of my favorites when you're intimate with the reality of death you will show up to your life to all of it, your relationships, your work, all of it in the most intimate way. Death is like the doorway to all the amazing feelings that most people are desperately searching for, right? But they're doing it in a way where they're never going to find it because they're thinking it's coming from outside of them. They're thinking it's not coming from the thoughts they're choosing. They're looking for it in money or a relationship or approval, in property, in false power, in status, and fame. You'll never find these feelings there. Guess what? Guess where you'll find it when you think about death. Isn't that funny? There's a catch, though. If you want to hold and expand the spectrum of feeling, if you want this full, juicy, fat experience that is so amazing, you've got to evolve your conscious mind the whole collective needs an evolution of how we think big time big time okay and in order to evolve your consciousness you have to have the ability to feel uncomfortable emotions right a lot of the reason why most people are stuck in that original mindset on death is because they're resisting emotions the fear comes and they're like shit resist and they're pushing it away. It's uncomfortable to feel feel fear. And when we're unwilling to let and allow an uncomfortable emotion be there, we actually make it bigger. We make it stick around longer. So to evolve the way we think, we have to move those feelings first. And to move the feelings, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. But most people don't know how to be uncomfortable because the thought is attached to the feeling. They think the thought is factual instead of optional. And because of the terror of the thought, not wanting it to be true, they push away the feeling. You tracking? And so in the exercise I'm going to give you today, before we wrap up, I'm going to help you through that a little bit. Evolution of consciousness also requires in this catch that you regulate your nervous system, that you even know what the fuck that is, that you take care of your body and allow all of it anger, 
right? The the frustration, the emotional highs and lows, right? You can't have a shamed, dysregulated nervous system if you want to evolve your consciousness. You've got to bring that along with you. That's what I always say. Bring your nervous system along. Let's not leave it back there. And finally, once you do the emotions and the nervous system stuff, you get to start managing your mind, which is a full-time gig, which does require energy. But guess what? You've got so much left over because you're no longer wasting all your energy, freaking the fuck out, stressing the fuck out, being overwhelmed and burnt out. So you're redirecting that energy to manage your mind carefully, which is a full-time job and it never ends. There's never a point in time where you will stop managing your mind. Guess what that time is? That time is death. And that's why death is so loving. It's like, come on home. You did a good job. Wasn't that a fun run? All right, let's kick your feet up, right? That is how I think about it. So managing your mind, you have to hold complexities down. Humanity is complex. It is not black or white. You are complex. You are not black or white. You are not good or bad. You are not right or wrong. You are the nuance in between all of it. Okay, and that the ability to do that requires strength and skill. It requires science and art. It requires the help of a philosopher. Okay, because these dominant feelings you have showing up right now that you're resisting, they're going to keep you stuck there until you break out of that cycle. Until you have a mirror, me, that's all I am, I'm your mirror, asking the questions that free you, right? And I'm not the only one out here, so I I want to be careful with my word. I've gotten some feedback recently, and I just want to make sure I'm not telling you I'm the only way you can do this. No, there's help everywhere. Literally, that is the universe I live in. Everything is for you. Help is all around you. You are supported in every way. I'm not the only way you get help. But if you're watching my channel, I am an option available, okay? So I just want to give that caveat there. So I'm going to wrap up there because I'm almost at an hour. And here's that exercise. So I'm going to give you just an example from my own life because I just used it. So when when you have the old mindset of fear and something scary happens, whether it's in the news or someone close to you has a scare or like actually something happens and it's not just an accident, it's like it actually happens. What's gonna happen is if you're in that old mindset, it's gonna be that prolonged suffering. It's gonna be miserable. You're gonna be stuck. You're gonna be resistant. You're gonna be tortured by the choices you are making in your mind, not from what happened to you from what you're choosing to think about it. So we need you to get in this other mindset before you do the exercise. If you're in the other mindset, this exercise probably won't work. My dog is like coughing right now. Um. Okay, so you're in the other mindset. You're thinking about death differently. If that doesn't do it for you, if that doesn't help you shift some things and think differently about things, use this exercise. I was just flying home from Hawaii a couple weeks ago and I have had my mindset shifted on death for a while, um, but I was, it was a red eye. So I was sleeping on the plane and I grew up with a pilot dad. And as a kid, we'd go on planes all the time. And I was taught that turbulence was fun. It was exciting, like a roller coaster. So when I would feel the bumps and the butterflies, I would be like, wait, this is so fun, right? I would have made an excellent flight attendant because I, it just didn't scare me. And for some reason, this recent flight home from Hawaii, I just had this plume of anxiety because I woke up from my sleep to turbulence that wasn't just like turbulence. It was like prolonged turbulence and it wasn't stopping. And so I brought in this exercise. So here it is. The thought that's causing the plume of anxiety and fear. It literally, for me, it's like, if you like see the cloud of an atomic bomb, that's how it feels. I like to cartoonize emotions because that's how we process them and feel them and welcome them in so we know who they are, identify them. Anyway, so plume of anxiety, fear, and I find the thought. I'm like, okay, Alicia, what you thinking, girl? And she's like, we're dying. We're dying on this plane. 
So the first thing I like to do is acknowledge the reality of it. I'm like, I don't say, yes, you are. Yep, you're totally going to die because that's what makes that worse. Then we start resisting the feeling because we're believing the thought is true. We don't want to do that. We want to see the thought, I'm dying. This plane is going down. We're dead. And we want to approach it with curiosity. You could. It's it's definitely a possibility. We don't know. We don't know, but you could absolutely die. We want to tell ourselves the truth in the fullest form is you're not wrong. Yeah, there's truth to that. Absolutely. And we have no idea. So that's the first step. So if it's not you, if it's if you're like, I'm so scared this might happen, we could use like your child as an example. I'm so scared this might happen. We want to tell yourself the truth. It could, it might happen. We have no idea. Okay. Let that settle in. Like we're letting the dust settle. And here I am letting the turbulence settle as I'm telling myself this. It could happen. I don't know. And then I just go to the feeling. So you have to really get to a place of acceptance. And that's why I like to deliver my stuff as truth, like in the truest form. To just say you might die isn't really the full picture. To say I'm going to die, that's just a lie. You just, there's no evidence to back that up. To say I'm not going to die is also a lie, right? On every count, because yes, you absolutely are. We just don't know when. So I like to bulk up the picture And get to that place of acceptance, allowance, surrender. It is the surrender that has to come first. It might. Okay. And here's where we bring in the rest of this mindset. We go, death is safe. Death is a part of nature. Death isn't bad and scary, right? It's going to happen for everyone. It's going to be at a different time for everyone, right? We want to bulk that up. And then we just want to be present with that experience, of the big emotion. So all I did was I just, I got to that surrender. I was like, you right, you right, it might happen, but I don't know. Set that aside. We don't, when we're feeling feelings, we don't bring the thoughts. We don't bring the stories with us. We go right into the body and the experience. And so what I started doing was I didn't resist the feeling. I was like, you are allowed to be here, plume of anxiety. I see why you're here. It makes sense. Thank you, nervous system, right? We've got to honor that fight or flight that we're always going in and out of. It's not a problem. It's only a problem when it gets jammed with punishment, shame, resistance, right? That's the only problem. So none of that. We're totally in fight or flight. We've got the feelings, the chemicals. It's all coursing through my body. And I just let it be there. And I just describe and experience the feeling in me without the words. I'm not call like I'm not saying this is a sign I'm going to die cuz that would make it really hard to feel the uncomfortable feeling of anxiety. That would be really hard if I'm like, okay, feel the feeling and I'm going to die. Ugh. No, that's why I used to faint all the time because that's what I was doing. I was believing the thought was true and then literally couldn't handle the experience of it cuz I thought it was true. This is why I'm kind of a pro at it because I used to faint and panic all the time because I could not stand uncomfortable emotions. Okay, so that's all I can really give you in this amount of time. I will tell you details of my program because that is where I teach you all of this stuff. I teach you how to feel a feeling. I teach you the model, any mindset you want, which really the one you want is to fall in love with yourself because that opens up the world for you. Um, so my program, it's one-on-one. It's just me and you for 24 weeks, one hour a week calls where I'm giving you a lesson for the first 15 minutes and the next 45 minutes, it's personalized coaching, personalized philosophy, if you will. I love it. And by the end of the 24 weeks, you will be in touch with reality right? You'll know how to question any thought. You'll basically be a mini philosopher by the end of it. You'll know how to, how to kind of guide yourself. So you won't need me, right? Really. It's just this first hump. We got to get over to reverse the thinking of the world that we've been taught the binary, all or nothing, black or white thinking, the resistance and pushing off of emotions, the fear of telling ourselves the truth, the just kind of reckoning with the avoidance and the ways we've been hiding and the ways we've been playing sports mall because we're fearing death right and opening all of that up and so it's a lot jam-packed into 24 weeks 
And there's always the opportunity to continue with me, which I love because I love when people open up and then they set bigger goals and then they're like, I want my own business and I want to do this and I want to keep going. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Um, That's how I am too. I'm never going to not be with a coach because I'm all about that expansion, baby. The best thing I've ever invested in is my brain and my freedom and my well-being and my emotional juiciness. So I can't recommend it highly enough. If you want to fall in love with yourself, if you want this freedom that everyone is looking for in all the wrong places, come check it out. You can book a consult on my website. It's alishaturnercoaching.com. That's E-L-L-I-C-I-A-T-U-R-N-E-R coaching.com. Click the button work with me and you can schedule a 60 minute consult Uh, To do an intake, that's what that's for. It's to make sure we're the right fit because we're not, I can't be the right coach for everyone. So just check that out before we start. Um, See what you want to use coaching for, where you're at, where you want to be and get started on our journey. Schedule that first call and begin. So if you want to move forward, then go to my website, alishaturnercoaching.com, book a consult and let's get started. All right, you guys, have a beautiful day. I hope this was helpful. Mwah.